Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon or good evening and welcome to the webinar on human rights and public procurement. My name is Milena Beckman and I work for the UN Environment Sustainable Public Procurement Team in Paris. Before we start, I will give you a brief introduction into the GoToWebinar tool. All attendees are on listen-only mode. If throughout the webinar you have a remark or a question, you can either raise your hand by using the corresponding button on the GoToWebinar control panel or write your questions in the question box and we will read them in due time. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available to you after the webinar. And without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Philippe Tapper, coordinator at ICLE and member of the coordination desk of the 10YP SPP program. Philippe Tapper, you, know, you now have the floor. Hello and a warm welcome from my side. Thanks, Melina, for the introduction. Um, and a welcome to this web sustainable procurement emerging good practices and lessons learned. The next slide, please. You all received the agenda and it's a particular pleasure to introduce this rich podium today to the webinar because I feel it's a, a manifold of experience in there uh, from uh, early beginners that uh, started already a decade ago in this topic to those that uh, just keep on working on this. It's really great to have you today with us, uh, Claire Messon O'Brien uh, from the Danish Institute for Human Rights, Nicole van der Molen from International Corporate Accountability Roundtable, Andy Davis who's director at the London University's Purchasing Consortium, Pauline Gersberg, who's national coordinator for the Swedish County Council, and Catherine Sven, who's a purchasing supervisor of the City of Medicine Finance Department. Thanks a lot. Next slide, please. I'm here to shortly introduce uh, to you the TAN YFP Sustainable Public Procurement. Uh, we are working here together to, to achieve a collective impact in terms of sustainable procurement. And uh, the, the, this is a program that is one of the first that has been now launched uh, as part of the 10 years framework program. Next slide, please. In Rio Plus 20 conference, uh, basically states reaffirmed that sustainable consumption production is a cornerstone of sustainable development and they created uh, the 10 year framework of programs and the vision of this 10 YFP is uh, to look into the fundamental changes in the way societies produce and consume um, uh, and that those are indispensable for achieving global sustainable development. Um, all major groups should play an active role. Um, therefore, this program also encompasses manifold of partners, stakeholders, practitioners and experts. Next slide, please. The 10 YP was adapted in Rio Plus 20 and is a global framework of action um, to enhance this international co cooperation. And um, the 10 YP program itself has the aim to support capacity building and provides technical and financial assistance to developing countries for this shift. Next slide, please. There are six programs active for part of the 10 YFP. Um, they are the Consumer Information Program, Sustainable Lifestyles and Education, Sustainable Public Procurement, Sustainable Buildings and Construction, Tourism, including ecotourism, and Food Systems. And those uh, programs are, have been all launched at various different states. Uh, status where they are working and uh, they all produce interesting outcomes and information uh, that is available on the 10 p website. Next slide, please. So basically you are coming to one of those programs, the 10 p on SPP. There are two main objectives. The first one is to build the case for SPP. Uh, we want to improve knowledge on SPP and its effectiveness as a tool to promote greener economies and sustainable development. And the second objective is to support the implementation of SPP on the ground uh, so to, to increase collaboration and improve coordination between 
uh, all kinds of stakeholders active in the field of sustainable public procurement. So this fits nicely with today's topic about uh, real case studies and actions in the field of socially responsible public procurement. Next slide, please. The 10 YFP SPP program has a certain government that follows, it's led by UNEP and co-led by ECLAN and Haiti. And we have a multi-advisory committee with uh, 22 members that you can see on the screen. This gets renewed and uh, periodically and, and uh, we're really, uh, it's great to have such diversity of partners there that bring their knowledge and action to the ground. Next slide, please. As of September, we have uh, 100 partners all across the world, as you can see on the website, um, and this is a growing partnership. So um, you can find further information on the website of the program, how to apply for the program. Next slide, please. Um, together with the partners and the MAC and the, within the coordination desk, we come up with a BNL work plan. So you can see here our plan for 2016 and 2017. It's basically split into a different kind of working areas that are working groups shared by different organizations. Um, not all of those that you see here are currently active, so we welcome potential leads and donors for non-active groups as well, but uh, most of them are. So, and then talking about today's uh, topic, of course, uh, related topics such as sustainable standards uh, or promoting resource efficient business models or something like this, tender implementation and impact monitoring, of course, are closely linked to the work we are doing. Next slide, please. That was everything for a quick introduction into the 10YFP uh, program and in particular uh, the SPP program. If you wish to connect with us, just sign up to our newsletter and if you want to know more about our work, you can also contact me. Back to you, Elena. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, I will now, now give the floor to our next speakers, Claire and, and Claire. The floor is now yours, Claire. Thank you, Milena. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this webinar. Um, on human rights and sustainable procurement. Um, we are organizing uh, this together with our partners through the International Learning Lab on Public Procurement and Human Rights, uh, which we have launched last year. Um, and the website, which you're warmly invited to visit after the session, is www.hrprocurementlab.org. Um, where you'll be able to find um, a lot more information about um, our activities and the topics that we'll be discussing here today. Um, my name is, is Claire Nevin O'Brien. I'm from the Danish Institute for Human Rights. We are a national human rights institution in Denmark. We're a public body ourselves and we work on this learning lab on public procurement and human rights with uh, the International Corporate Accountability Roundtable um, which is an NGO, uh, civil society coalition, um, as well as um, the other organizations who are represented, of course, on the panel today. Next slide, please. The aim of the Learning Lab um, is to constitute a network across disciplines um, of different personnel and organizations, all of whom have a common interest in sustainable public procurement and particularly the human rights dimensions um, of sustainable procurement. Um, so we aim to uh, embrace both public procurement practitioners, uh, people on the policy side who address procurement, civil society, also legal um, advisors and practitioners in public procurement, um, as, as well as national human rights institutions and others. So anybody who is um, listening to the webinar now um, hopefully um, will be encouraged to join us in the public procurement uh, laboratory and our activities. We aim to be a forum for an open dialogue and sharing of experiences across countries and jurisdictions um, on different approaches that people have tried um, in order to promote respect for human rights um, in the course of public purchasing. Um, we hope through 
drawing people together, uh, we'll be able to identify good uh, emerging and effective practices in the area of human rights and procurement. Um, we will be able to disseminate those to an interested audience and therefore uh, scale up uh, also the, the extent of good practices in this new area. Um, next slide, please. We have been prompted to establish Learning Lab um, is largely provided uh, by the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Some of you may have heard about UN Guiding Principles. Um, they are by now the principal uh, framework addressing the responsibilities of governments and the responsibilities of business um, in relation to human rights. Um, and they have three main uh, components. The first is the state's duty to protect human rights, which means that the state has to um, fulfill its responsibilities to regulate business activities um, so, so that human rights are respected. The second main and central part is that companies themselves um, in their capacity as producers, as suppliers to government and otherwise also have a responsibility to respect human rights, which they should fulfill by doing human rights due diligence. Um, and thirdly, anyone who's a victim of uh, abuses to their human rights involving business should have some kind of recourse and remedy um, to uh, address that. And these responsibilities of government and business uh, encompass all internationally recognized human rights, and, and this is true in any country uh, in which you're situated as a public procurer or where your suppliers are based. And the UN Dining Principles were unanimously adopted by the UN Human Rights Council in 2011, and since then have been also endorsed or approved by almost all um, major organizations in, in the global business and economic area, such as the OECD, UN Global Compact, and many, many national governments. Next slide, please. The UN Guiding Principles um, go into quite some detail about the responsibilities of both government in relation to business and businesses' own uh, responsibilities um, for human rights. And um, as the slide shows, in relation to government's responsibilities uh, for human rights, if you could go back to the correct slide deck. Thank you. Um, the UN Guiding Principles single out that governments and public bodies have got a responsibility um, in relation to their commercial transactions, um, both as purchasers and also in the context of contracting out, to make sure that uh, they take all reasonable steps to ensure that human rights are respected. Next slide, please. So specifically, um, in relation to uh, contracting out of public services and also commercial transactions, um, which is identified in the guiding principles as, in, of course, including public procurement, the guiding principles say that public authorities and governments um, must take measures to promote respect for human rights by those business enterprises that are suppliers to them. Next slide, please. Um, the guiding principles are being implemented by national governments in um, one way, which is through national action plans, or NAPs, on business and human rights. And um, there are about 30 countries worldwide that are currently in the process of developing uh, a national action plan on business and human rights to implement the UN guiding principles. Um, around 10 national action plans have been published already. Um, this includes the National Action Plans of the Netherlands and the United Kingdom, which are uh, expert excerpts of which are here on this slide. And all those National Action Plans so far, which have been published, do uh, address public procurement on the guiding principles, which were on the previous slide, which um, highlight uh, public authorities' responsibility to integrate human rights into their public purchasing practices. Um, so here you can see a couple of the measures which governments have promised to take at the national level um, in order to fulfill and, and promote this responsibility they have to try to work with human rights in the area of public purchasing. Next slide. Beyond the UN system, um, the guiding principles have also been assimilated 
um, into uh, other significant policy frameworks in the context of procurement. The ISO, the International Standards Organization, is currently in the process of developing guidance, uh, the ISO 2400 guidance on sustainable procurement. So that's guidance which addresses both private sector and, and public procurement. Um, and that new guidance, which will um, be concluded by the start of next year, um, is aligned with the UN guiding principles. So it, it does suggest to public and private procurers the ways in which they can um, integrate human rights into their purchasing policy and practices. The uh, 2014 EU procurement directives similarly contain some new provisions which make it easier um, for public buyers to include um, measures at different points within the contracting process which allow them to uh, encourage public buyers to um, work with suppliers and within the tendering process um, to uh, include human rights terms. Obviously there's a lot of complexity there as anyone that's worked with the EU procurement directives will know um, and we could have a probably a whole webinar looking at exactly the ways in which the new directives um, can be used to promote human rights. Maybe, maybe we'll do that um, at some point in the future. But just to flag for the moment that there is some new leeway within the new directives um, to work with human rights issues. Um, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, of course, does include uh, a specific sustainable development goal under which public procurement um, is uh, a, a factor. Um, so equally governments which have all committed to the 23rd um, in the last year should now be also considering what ways they can um, align their commitments on human rights to this sustainable public procurement commitment and, and how to bring those together. Um, and finally, there's been at the very high level of the G7 uh, G20 and, and the ILO at their last annual meeting this year, um, strong statements from these global organizations uh, on the need for global value chains to become more sustainable, um, to respect human rights, and you know, in some cases particularly to develop specific risks such as um, human trafficking and modern slavery. So all of these um, in combination show us that there is an increasing interest from the government side in um, trying to find ways in which human rights can be uh, incorporated in a more effective way into public purchasing. Next slide. That interest is also um, on the part of civil society and if we review the last few years we can see um, an increasing number of investigations and reports by civil society organizations, the media, um, campaign, advocacy campaigns and national human rights institutions which pinpoint um, the practices of public buyers and um, have identified many instances of, um, of serious labor rights and other human rights abuses in the supply chains of public buyers. So we can see that this is also uh, an area of emerging reputational and legal risk potentially for public buyers as of course it has become for um, big name brands in the private sector in the previous decades. Next slide. Um, within the Learning Lab, we have recently done a, a survey across 20 jurisdictions. Um, and I'll be very brief on this because you can find the report uh, in full on our website. Um, but what we have found so far is that um, despite all these high level policy commitments and the evidence of abuses in, in public buyer supply chains, um, at the moment there's not a, a particularly strong or helpful policy framework um, or tools or guidance made available from central government to local public buyers, for example, to help them navigate um, what can be quite complicated legal issues. Um, uh, neither is there much guidance or uh, tools which like link public buyers to good practices that have been um, undertaken or piloted by other organizations. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, on, the, on the plus side, there are um, very green shoots of good practices um, of innovation across public authorities um, around the world, oftentimes in combination with civil society partners who have been experimenting with ways in which either um, at the con stage of contract clauses or through the use of um, transparency requirements, for instance, that they pass uh, on to those who supply them, that, that public buyers are uh, beginning to work with human rights in really good and interesting ways. Um, and this obviously represents a big opportunity for promoting human rights, promoting the sustainable development goal, goals, achieving um, those uh, commitments and visions on the part of government if we can uh, really uh, multiply the effect of these kinds of good practices and um, share them to a broader audience of public public buyers. And that's really, um, yes, next slide, that's really why we're uh, organizing this webinar and we're so happy to have so far identified the next three speakers in the webinar, um, who each of whom um, already is working with human rights uh, in their purchasing practices in very exciting ways, um, and we hope this will be the first of various engagements where we, where we will be able to uh, sh showcase these kinds of good practices and hopefully also learn about more uh, instances of innovation uh, amongst those of, the, those of you who are listening to this webinar now. So just to repeat my invitation um, that I made at the beginning of the webinar discussion, uh, please do visit our website. Um, hrprocurementlab.org um, and you're most welcome also to join us at our next workshop in Geneva on the 17th of November. Um, you'll find registration details uh, on our website um, where we will have a whole day of, of discussion and further exploration um, of these kinds of good practices. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. We'll now be hearing our next speaker, uh, Andy Davis. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm speaking to you from London. And good afternoon to you from a, a grey London this afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Davis. I'm the director of the London University's Purchasing Consortium. I'm very pleased to be taking part in this webinar. We're also an organization that's very pleased to be a part of the International Learning Lab, which Claire was just talking about. Um, next slide, please. Um, London University's Purchasing Consortium is a not-for-profit professional buying organization. Next slide, please. And um, I want to talk to you today about the importance of maximizing our leverage, the importance of collaborating between public authorities in the face of this very grave challenge that's facing us um, today um, and how important it is to us. Next slide, please. Just a little bit about LUPC. Um, we're one of six university purchasing consortia in the United Kingdom. We're owned by our members, for our members, and we put into place collaborative procurement arrangements across a range of spend categories, some of which are high risk as regards um, endangerment of human rights. And that's, it's those areas in which we are concentrating our efforts at the moment in order to undertake due diligence across our supply chains. Um, next slide, please. LUPC has 72 full LUPC members, and, uh, and as you can see, we're spending a fairly large amount of money um, for our, on behalf of our members. Next slide, please. And it's very important that we share the values of our members. Universities, students, lecturers, all alike, carry and share, in the main, very um, important uh, values which we like to reflect. And in these days, I think, particularly for students and buyers of research services, they want to be ensure that their institutions are um, walking the talk, that they are very much concerned about where they spend their money, and, uh, and that we can conduct um, goods and services with, a, with very much an eye on uh, doing so without causing harm to others. Next slide, please. 
Um, actually, I think I think Claire's already covered this one, so I'll, I'll go on to the next slide if I may, because that was about the UN guidance principle number six. Now, in the United Kingdom. Um, Last year came into force the Modern Slavery Act 2015, which apart from a piece of state legislation in the state of California and the USA, um, we believe is, is unique in the world at the moment. And it does require all commercial organizations with a turnover in excess of £36 million sterling per annum to publish a, a, an annual statement saying what that company or organization has done to address risks to human rights in their supply chains. And right now, um, uh, universities, the lawyers have told us that universities, that's many of our members, have, uh, have uh, been advised that we are captured within the legal definition of commercial organizations. So the opportunity is there for the higher education sector in the United Kingdom to take a lead on this. Um, however, right now a private member's bill is also working its way through Parliament. By no means all private member's bills come to be law, but um, that private member's bill looks to extend the requirement to have transparency in supply chains across public authorities. So this is, this is a, a very hot topic for us in public service in the United Kingdom at the moment. Next slide, please. This, this is what's uh, advised by the United Kingdom Home Office on what should go into a statement. Um, so as you can see, organizational structure, something about the vision, priorities, and policy of the organization, though there should not be a confusion. This is not a piece of policy itself. The statement is an annual statement described to set out what what areas, what categories of goods and services are being purchased and what risks are perceived to be inherent in those spend areas. So in universities, for example, our high risk categories are electronics, apparel, and um, some services, uh, particularly in cleaning services and security services, which are where low pay is very prevalent and that there is the danger of human trafficking, particularly in those, in those areas. What's also important to report in the, in the statement is what due diligence processes are currently in place, but also what the plans are by that organization in the future. And remember, there's something like 12,000 organizations, mostly commercial businesses in the United Kingdom, who are required to produce these um, reports. And the very, very very first reports are being published now. So what, it, what that's doing is it's shining a light across business to say, here is what um, they are doing in order to address this problem. And therefore, there's an opportunity there for public service in the United Kingdom to observe what is, what is happening and to build on that. Next slide, please. Uh, other things that could be encouraged to be part of that um, part of that statement. And this is these are the kind of behaviors that are being encouraged by the Modern Slavery Act. Um, awareness training for senior management teams, or in fact, awareness training for anybody working in organizations. We find a lot of keenness coming from uh, colleagues in, uh, in procurement in public service now who are, who are looking to play a very active role in their organizations, not just spreading the word about human rights and supply chains, but also about um, the, the signs of human trafficking generally and encouraging employees within their organizations to look out for the signs of uh, people who who might be in real danger and therefore um, uh, perhaps for a matter for reporting to the police. Reports of um, modern slavery and human trafficking do seem to be increasing in the United Kingdom. Um, that's on the UK mainland, and the Home Office estimates that perhaps up to 13,000 people may be working in, and living in modern slavery in the United Kingdom at the moment. So it's a, this is a problem that's very real and close to home, as well as being one that addresses us um, from uh, high-risk source countries and high-risk spend categories from uh, supply chains around the world. The other message that we're putting across is that we feel that it's very much collaboration with others that uh, offers the best return um, in, in making progress to, to, to fight modern slavery and human trafficking. Um, that might be by using consortium framework agreements, for example, like ours, which we have more and more of our agreements are constructed in ways which undertake a fuller due diligence than we've ever carried out before 
on suppliers, on supply chains, and on committing to work with our suppliers. I've met a lot of people who say, um, isn't it just a matter of putting a termination event in a contract? Isn't it just a matter of saying, if we find instances of labor rights abuses or human rights abuses uh, in your supply chain, we will terminate contracts. In fact, I'm being told by the, the, the experts that we've been working with um, uh, in the International Learning Lab and elsewhere is that the, by having a, terminate, a simple termination event, it's moving the problem and encouraging a lot of covering up in supply chains and, and uh, uh, people m m hiding the issue. Um, in fact, it's collaboration not just between public authorities, but between us and our supply partners where the best uh, chances of really dealing with this problem uh, come to light. And I'm going to talk about an example in a minute. I also wanted to mention the fact that in 2014, LUPC became a founding member of Electronics Watch, which is a, an independent monitoring organization for public authorities in the European Union designed for the purpose of protecting people working in electronics supply chains around the world from human rights and labor rights abuses. And um, we've had some very real success of this uh, uh, so far already, in fact, in our, in our uh, relationship uh, with our partners in Electronics Watch. Next slide, please. Uh, I think I'm, yeah, this is Electronics Watch. Next one, please. By the way, before I tell you about our uh, particular case study, um, uh, many, of, uh, many of our institutions, many of our universities, particularly the smaller ones, will say to me, how can we have an influence over a global electronic supply industry when we have a, you know, we only spend a fairly small amount on IT? But the point is, collectively, our sector in the United Kingdom spends quite significant amounts of money on IT. In fact, we think about £800 million every year. Um, now, that's about 1% of the estimate for public sector procurement of electronics across the European Union, which was estimated recently to be about €94 billion, Euros, I believe. Um, that actually means that we're a very, very powerful voice. And um, as our case study that I'm about to tell you about uh, does demonstrate. Next slide, please. Just a picture, though, um, if you will, of our universities today, and if you haven't yet heard of Generation Z, um, then certainly many of my colleagues working in, uh, in universities in the UK are about to meet Generation Z. These are young people who have grown up with social media and for whom human rights abuses are big news and are very important to them. And interestingly, it's news about human rights because they're so ridiculously well connected News about human rights abuses spread fast, especially when rights abuses are reported in the supply chain of the university they attend. Um, I've pleaded with universities um, that they cannot gamble with their reputation. Not only is this a reputational issue, but it is a, a moral issue of, as well, of course. But it, but it is, in fact, a very real business driver for universities in the United Kingdom. Um, and certainly there is there can be no business in this case for abusing people. So uh, some universities are having to find extra resource to uh, contend with this problem. Next slide, please. So I want to tell you about um, a case study that we had some part in, and it involved our colleagues at Electronics Watch. And this particular example involved servers and the purchase of servers, electronic servers. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, we in universities in the UK have a framework agreement, a competitive framework agreement for x86 servers um, with three suppliers among, are, are on our agreement amongst others, and those three suppliers are Dell, HP, and Lenovo. And some colleagues at a Danish media and research company called Danwatch um, came, uh, ran an expose on a company called the Wistron Corp who operate a plant in Guangdong province in China and where we heard about um, cohorts of students, of Chinese students, 
who were being forced to work on the production line. Um, and they were being forced to work under the menaces of not being allowed to graduate. In fact, not being able to collect their diploma. Now, many of these students, even though this was described to them as an internship, many of these students were, would be studying a vocational uh, degree in something like agriculture. So it's not as if an internment, internship in an electronics production line would be teaching them very much. Um, so we were very concerned about this, not least because right now 89,000 Chinese students study and conduct research with us in UK universities right now. And uh, so this is a, a very important customer group for us in UK universities and quite apart from the, the very real moral um, question of, of uh, forced labor in this kind of uh, spend category, but it's, it was just the mere fact that the reputational risk coming from having this uh, having students working in a forced environment manufacturing servers for us. Now, we raised that specter with our, uh, our three manufacturers there and under, with Electronics Watch's support, now this is where that support came in absolutely invaluable because Electronics Watch was able to be very clear about what the allegations were. They gave us as, as public authorities very clear recommendations about the action we should take and importantly, they gave us chapter and verse, line and, and paragraph on which legislation, and that would be local labor legislation, Chinese labor laws, and international labor organization conventions were at risk of breach if these allegations proved to be founded. And that gave us the, all the information we needed to contact our suppliers. The first question we asked them was, is this factory in Guangdong province one which is being used to manufacture our servers? And it turned out it was. Um, secondly, we invited our suppliers to uh, carry out their own investigations and report back to us on, where, on what, the extent to which the allegations that were, were founded. And thirdly, what steps were they going to take if they were founded um, to address this issue for us? Naturally, we expressed our very most sincere concerns about the, the situation. Now, to their credit, Dell, Lenovo, and Hewlett Packard Enterprises all responded extremely well to, uh, to our questions and were very quick in carrying out unannounced audits in the factory. Now, both they and the Wistron Corporation denied that forced labor was being used. Their, their account was that students were given a choice about which internship to, uh, to undertake. Now for us, that did, that did contradict interviews with workers that had been carried out on the ground by Downwatch. Um, and interestingly, our suppliers did uh, cease the practice of uh, taking on students for, in, in situations like this there is an understanding that many factories in China look upon vocational schools and other educational establishments to provide labor in order to support the economy. Um, but we've set out very clearly that that's not, a, that's not a situation that works for us. And we understand that the practice was stopped. It, very, very soon we hope that um, we will be sending our own independent auditors to go into the factory to check that the, that the practice has ceased permanently. Of course, this is one factory in the supply chain, a very large supply chain, a very large group of factories in a very large group of com countries that are manufacturing electronics. It's a small win, but it's one that we believe is very positive. It's very positive for us. It's very positive for electronics watching. We believe it's very positive for public authorities across Europe. That's where I wanted to conclude. Thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you very much, David. We'll now have our next presentation from Pauline Gertberg. The floor is yours, Pauline. 
Thank you very much, my, my Lena, for the introduction. And um, uh, good afternoon, everybody, from a, from a great Stockholm as well. Uh, and thank you, Andy, for a very interesting presentation. Um, as we all know, there are different tools in the political toolbox. And, and one interesting development that I think is that public procurement is, is more and more being used as a political tool to reach uh, sustainable developments. And co considering the fact that the public sector in Europe procure goods and services to the amount of 2.4 trillion euros, and we're talking 19% almost about the um, EU GDP, uh, we have every chance to use that joint buying power to create a demand for sustainable products. Uh, my presentation today will focus on, on three things. Um, some of the uh, human rights uh, risks involved in, in our supply chains. Um, how we have chosen to work with sustainable procurement, what tools and guidance we have developed, and finally also uh, what I think uh, are the challenges and what needs to be uh, improved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are uh, three uh, democratic levels in Sweden, and the main responsibilities for the county councils are healthcare, dental care, and public transportation. Uh, we procure procure goods and services to the amount of 13 billion euros a year. And, and many of the products that we procure are being manufactured in dev development countries where the risks for human rights uh, violations and uh, uh, labor rights uh, violations are very high. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one area, uh, uh, procurement area, is pharmaceuticals. And, and obviously, we procure pharmaceuticals to give to patients uh, here in Sweden to make, make them well. Uh, but at the same time, there are some serious human rights risks connected to the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. Uh, previous research has shown that sediment and surface water and groundwater contains an increasing amount of pharma in large manufacturing countries, such as uh, India and China. And obviously, this constitutes a danger to the environment, which WHO has identified as one of the biggest threats to global health today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another uh, large procurement area is gloves. Um, and um, we are large. Uh, we buy large quantities of, of uh, surgical gloves. 70% uh, of those are being manufactured in uh, Malaysia. And Malaysia, a very large proportion of their economy is based on migrant workers from countries such as Burma, Indonesia, and Nepal. Uh, migrant workers whose fundamental rights are often violated. Um, last year, we detected slave labor in one of the factories. Um, migrant workers had their passports confiscated, and in some cases, they were working for 45 consecutive days uh, and had 140 hours over the time in a month. Next slide, please. And uh, in 2007, uh, a Swedish NGO um, detected hazardous working condition, child labor and salaries uh, way below minimum wages in factories um, supplying uh, uh, instruments uh, to the Swedish healthcare sector uh, being produced in Pakistan. And this critique um, uh, against our procurement practices became very much our wake-up call. So um, to conclude, there are some material risks in many of our supply chains. Next slide, please. So why is it so important to work with sustainable public procurement? Well, uh, as some of the speakers before have stated, a state has an obligation to respect and protect and, and fulfill human rights. And we cannot conduct healthcare in Sweden to the, to the detriment of people's health somewhere else. Um, but also, using our joint power, we have an opportunity to create a demand for sustainable products and services. And uh, finally, also, I mean, it's a matter of, of, of risk management. Uh, inhumane conditions in factories that produce goods for the Swedish hospitals is obviously not only an economic risk, it's a reputational risk, and I would also say a political risk. Next slide, please. So how is this being implemented in the Swedish county councils? Well, we believe that this is more cost effective to do on a national level. We are 21 county councils and we should not invent the wheel 21 times. Um, 
we have developed the common code of conduct, uh, we have the same contractor agreements. Since we share the same supplier base, we can therefore also uh, co-finance audits and share results. Um, uh, but we do not only share results uh, internally uh, among us, we, because the audit reports will also become publicly available. Uh, we think that transparency to citizens is also an important aspect um, that obviously has to be balanced with the intellectual property of, of, of the suppliers. Next slide, please. So how is this being enforced in public procurement? Uh, as I mentioned, we have a common code of conduct for suppliers. Uh, we are leaning on ex existing global frameworks and conventions that have not invented themselves. It's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's the ILO core convention. It's in environmental aspects. And it's also the United Nations um, Conventions Against Corruption. Um, this code of conduct has been politically adopted in the County Council, which is very, very good. But uh, a code of conduct is not worth more than the paper it's written on unless it's being implemented. So we are enforcing the code of conduct by including them into our terms of contracts. Next slide, please. So to make sure that suppliers are meeting the requirements, they have to have policies and processes in place. Uh, and it always starts a tone at the top. Uh, we want to see a policy commitment. Um, effective integration and appropriate action also needs a clear division of responsibility. Uh, accountability should be forwarded to our suppliers, sub-suppliers. Uh, and then we require our suppliers to have a due diligence process in order to assess risks in their supply chains. Uh, they have to monitor and verify compliance, but also handling non-compliance, uh, i.e. the remedy part, the third leg of the uh, UN guiding principles. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and also, and I think this is important, uh, the supplier also has to make it possible for us to conduct inspections at the production sites of the supplier or any of the supplier sub subcontractors. Um, but, I mean, obviously, we will always, as a first step, check the supplier's management system for systematics and sustainability work and, and ask for documentation, etc. Uh, an audit is, is a mean to check whether those management systems work and are effective. Next slide, please. So in, in the same way, way that we ask our suppliers to do their due diligence, we have to do the same thing. We have identified eight areas where the risks to people's rights are high. Um, a risk analysis is being done for each of these eight uh, prioritized risk areas. Next slide, please. But just identifying our risk is not enough. We also have to work to mitigate those. So based on the risk analysis, we then develop action plans on where we want to be in three years' time. Um, and this action plan is, is, is obviously based on the most severe risk. We set goals and we plan follow-ups, audits, and also supplier dialogues. Um, and all this information is also publicly available on, on our website. Uh, next slide, please. So to help both suppliers and procurement offices uh, through the processes, we have developed the guidance. And, and this is inspired by the UNGP reporting initiative, but has obviously been adapted to the procurement processes. And this guidance will also be translated into English, and we would be very happy to share that with, with any one of you. Uh, next slide, please. So. Um, does this model work in practice, or is it just uh, a paper, a huge paper tiger? Well, um, this method has proven successful in some of the risk areas, and I just want to share results from, from some of the recent reports. Um, last year, uh, Swedwatch actually went back to Pakistan to check some of the factories uh, that we are still sourcing from, and the repo report shows improvement to working conditions compared to other factories that where buyers were not making these demands. Um, as I mentioned earlier, last year we detec detected um, trafficking and bonded labor in one of the factories supplying surgical gloves from Malaysia. 
Uh, and in fact, in January, um, the uh, suppliers had corrected most of the violations. Um, I think it's overtime that is still outstanding. But one of the um, main improvements is that the supplier now has agreed to assume responsibility for all the recruitment costs in the future. So that would at least put the end to slave labor, at least in these factories. Uh, this report uh, was actually compiled by British Medical Association and can, can be uh, retrieved by them. Uh, and finally, uh, in February, uh, I think uh, Andy uh, mentioned Electronics Watch, uh, they also came out with um, a report or a case study uh, on how we have made a difference with IT supplier Dell to become uh, more uh, transparent. So um, I think what these reports show is that public procurement uh, uh, can make and is making uh, a difference, um, which is obviously very positive. Um, so, but I think still think we have a, a long way to go and I, I would like to end this presentation with addressing some of the challenge, challenges that we face. Uh, next uh, slide please. Um, well first of all when it comes to audits, uh, there are some critique against the practice of doing audits. Some say that it's only creating uh, an 80 billion dollar worth of business for auditors and have no real effect for workers. But for us, I think audits are still an important tool. So um, I think it's about improving maybe the quality of audits. Um, they have to start address the maybe the issue of slave labor, for example, uh, and also um, the on-site audit has to have to be uh, triangulated with off-site interviews. And this is uh, maybe one of the reasons also that we have decided that as of this year to join the Electronics Watch, which uh, actually can uh, provide us with that. So um, follow-ups are obviously absolutely necessary, but I don't think they're sufficient. Um, we also have to work very proactively together with our suppliers. Um, uh, we do seminars, um, uh, educations, but we also uh, have action plans, etc. So the proactive work is, is equally important and here. I think we can also do much more. Um, the third thing on my list is um, very much uh, related to maybe something that could be called an internal health check. Um, so do we have enough resources, mandate time to do this work? We put an awful lot of responsibility on our suppliers, but do we have the internal capacity to work with important aspects? Um, the last but not least, um, even if we procure for 13 billion euros, we are a small buyer on a global scale and, and therefore we can increase our leverage by cooperating with, with other public buyers. Um, we are already cooperating with the Norwegian healthcare sector, British Medical Association, NHS and other important actors, but I think here we could also do um, uh, see much more cooperation between the European countries. Um, so these are basically the improvements um, I will, or challenges I would like to uh, I see. Um, next slide, please. This is the end of the presentation, so um, thank you very much, and please contact me or my colleagues if you want more information. Um, I would just like to say that um, I really do hope for the future that uh, we see strong political leadership. Uh, public procurement should be used to protect human rights, not the other way around. And public procurement is, uh, if it's done right, it can be a very, very effective tool to reach a sustainable development and also the Agenda 2030. So by those words, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, it is now time for our last presentation from Katie Schwenz. Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, good morning from Madison, Wisconsin. And I, as you were told, I'm Kathy Schwinn. I'm the purchasing supervisor for the city of Madison. Next slide. So where is Madison? Um, Madison's a mid-sized city in the Midwest of the United States. Uh, we currently have a population of about 250 to around 300,000. Next slide. 
Um, just a picture of our beautiful downtown. Uh, we have an annual operating budget of close to about $300 million. Next slide. Oops. Madison is the capital city of Wisconsin. Next slide. And we're also home to the flagship campus for the University of Wisconsin. And we're also home to the first transparent uniform purchasing contract. And next slide. In the early 2000s, the students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus became aware that the uh, Nike Corporation was using sweatshop labor in their supply chains. And at that time, Nike was the supplier for the University of Wisconsin-Madison's athletic apparel. So the students band together, and then they requested that that the Chancellor of the UW-Madison require Nike to correct their abuses of, with regards to sweatshop labor or else they wanted the university to stop using Nike for their athletic apparel. Next slide. The City of Madison Alders became aware of those issues and they felt that the city should also require that manufacturers that provide clothing for the City of Madison not use sweatshop labor. So in 2005, the Madison Common Council passed Madison General Ordinance MGO 4.25, Procurement of Items of Apparel. And this ordinance was and still is the most strict supply chain ordinance in the United States. MGO 4.25 has a lot of features to it, and one of the features is that it protects workers' rights. It requires that manufacturers follow the core labor standards, like those outlined by the International Labor Organization such as freedom of association, not using child or forced labor, a prohibition on discrimination with respect to workers' rights. In addition to those coarse labor standards, we also require that manufacturers pay their workers a living wage, that they ensure the health and safety of their workers, that they ensure the women's rights, and that they're compliant with international, state, and local laws with regards to their wages, working hours, and working conditions. MGO 4.25 also requires what we call bidder disclosures from all manufacturers that supply the city with $5,000 or more in annual apparel purchases. The information that's required on those disclosures are the factory location, the lead worker or principal owners of that factory, and then we also ask for the average wage information for the line workers. They're required to disclose the average per hour paid if any overtime is paid if any other benefits are offered, the average number of hours worked in a week, and then the actual number of hours of the number of hours worked for the past three months. MGO 4.25 also requires ongoing monitoring of the manufacturers. To accomplish this, Madison had to had to team up with an independent monitoring agency, and we work with the Sweat Free Purchasing Consortium. We use them to help us vet the information that we received. The consortium maintains a database called LinkUp that lists factory locations and other information that they have received from various cities around the United States like Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, California, and Los Angeles, California. The consortium then compares the information that they received from our manufacturers to what they already had on file to ensure that the information was correct. And MGO 4.25 was written to help encourage manufacturer compliance, not to punish them. Our hope was that we would receive honest information from our manufacturers and we could then we could look at that information and help them change their practices if they didn't line up with what our requirements were rather than punish them and just not use them. Next slide. So for the first 10 years or so, the city purchasing allowed various agencies within the city to procure their apparel separately. Um, we found that none of the vendors were, that were being used were able to get the required bidder disclosures from their manufacturers. Okay, next slide. So in 2014, city purchasing decided to try to get the three largest public, um, the three largest city agencies, the fire department, the Madison Metro Transit Public Transit Department 
and the police department to join together and use one vendor for the uniforms. The three agencies combined together would have an annual spend of just over 600000 and our hope was that this increase in purchasing power would be enough incentive for the vendors to comply with MGO 4.25. Next slide. And there's a, just a slide of their budget. Next. So we, in May of 2014, we issued a request for proposal RFP number 8300. And this RFP required bidder disclosures from all manufacturers with annual purchases of 5,000 or more. And these bidder disclosures were required prior to submitting a proposal to the RFP. And then we worked with the Sweat Free Purchasing Consortium in the City of Madison Sweat Free Committee to develop a sliding scale requirement for the disclosures because we felt that we, we wouldn't be able to get 100% compliance right away. And so rather we decided to require a 60% uh, bidder disclosure requirement in working with a 10% increase every year until 100% compliance was achieved. And then we also assigned a point value to the factory location information that we received and the wage information that we received. That way manufacturers could also receive partial credit if they disclosed only some of the required information. The RFP also required a sweat-free compliance plan from manufacturers that had more than $25,000 in annual purchases within the first year. This plan was to inform the city of the manufacturer's current labor standards and what, if any, process they had in place for their complaints. It also required them to address their, par their procedures for corrections if anything was determined to be noncompliant. The RFP also added a rebate component to the resulting contract. And this rebate was specifically earmarked for independent monitoring of manufacturer transparency. And you can see there the way that the rebate was structured. And then the RFP also required that the resulting contract be set up as a cooperative purchasing contract. This meant that any other entity, a municipality, school district, state, county, could contract with that, with that vendor and receive the same pricing and sweat-free transparency that the City of Madison had without having to issue their own RFP. That's a, a really nice feature for other, com for other uh, municipalities. It saves them a lot of time and money. And our hope was that in adding this clause, that more entities would sign on and that would increase our purchasing power and it would add to the number of manufacturers that would be willing to supply us the bidder disclosures and the compliance plans. Next. So the um, RFP was issued and the city received the required 60% of bidder disclosures from four vendors. And we're really excited about this because we did not think we would even, we weren't sure if we would even get one bidder to, to reply. So um, we got the four vendors and we eliminated one vendor for a non-sweat-free reason and we asked the remaining three to submit proposals. After we saw the proposals, all three were invited to Madison for vendor interviews and the evaluation panel unanimously selected one vendor, Gauls, to award the RFP to. Um, the city signed a one-year contract with two two-year renewal options with goals in April of 2015. In the contract, we included the required sweat-free compliance language. And then in April of 2016, we exercised the first of the two renewals, and our current contract now expires in April of 2018. Next slide. So we learned three key lessons in this process, and the first one was that vendors respond to the almighty dollar. When we let the agencies purchase on their own, nobody was able to get the required bidder disclosures, but once we put them together and combined their purchasing power, we were able to get four, four vendors to reply. And the fact that we were able to do that with only $600,000 of purchasing power was really quite a feat. So imagine if larger entities were to join in or in the purchasing power went into the millions or billions. I just think we could really make a difference. And second, we learned that the vendors will do whatever's in their best interest. So it was our it was in our interest to show them why requiring their manufacturers to comply with the sweat free requirement would, would increase their sales and then they were more apt to work with us to do that. 
And finally, we learned that it's very important to work with the vendor toward compliance and not to punish them for non-compliance. The vendor felt like they were caught between a rock and a hard place because they wanted to give us the bitter manufacturers that we required, but sometimes the manufacturers would refuse. So I was able to actually help Culls receive the required bitters in a couple of instances by writing directly to the manufacturer and letting them know that if they didn't give us the required bitter disclosures, that we would be forced to pick a different manufacturer. And this had the desired result, and we received the bitter disclosures that Gauls was not able to get on their own. Next slide. So challenges for the future, the, the city faces includes increasing our purchasing power. As of yet, no other entities have signed on to this contract, and that's, that's a pretty big disappointment. We've advertised our contract on the Sweat Repurchasing Consortium website, as well as on the Wisconsin Association of Public Procurements website. We really need to increase our purchasing power to increase the number of manufacturers that we can offer on this contract. And also, the city can't do this alone. We rely and continue to rely heavily on the Sweat Repurchasing Consortium. The consortium has been able to help us vet the accuracy of the bidder disclosure information that we received. It helped us develop the point system and to score the disclosures. And the Sweat Free Purchasing Consortium added our city's disclosures to their link-up database so that others could see this information also. Um, the Sweat Free Purchasing Consortium and the city are also struggling with how to do in-depth factory monitoring. Next slide. It will cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do factory monitoring properly, so we're looking into a multi-city approach to accomplish this. We're hoping to find one common manufacturer that Madison, San Francisco, Portland, Los Angeles, and Austin all use. That way these cities could share the cost of this in-depth monitoring and find a, with the common manufacturer. The city would love to be a part of a multi-city RFP offering that would combine the purchasing power of some mid to large size cities. As of right now, that doesn't exist. I, I haven't heard of any organizations trying to put that together, but we would love to be a part of it if anyone knows anything about that. And that's all I have, so thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone. This was our last presentation. And we will now open the questions and answers session. Uh, so if you have one, um, please raise your hand button on the control panel. And we will unmute you so you will be able to ask your questions. Um, and in the meantime, I will start reading the questions that we already received. So uh, panelists, you will be able uh, to respond. So, um, our first question to panelists, what would be, in your opinion, the main barrier to the inclu inclusion of human rights as a criterion in uh, procurement? Uh, hi, it's Andy here. I might be able to offer a, an answer to that. In fact, two, two possible answers, very quickly. Um, first one is, I think there are some public who imagine there might be legal barriers, um, particularly here in the European Union, um, and particularly here in the UK, actually. Um, you may or may not know that the European Union directives on public procurement are in, embodied in the Public Contracts Regulations 2015 here in the United Kingdom, and the requirement there is that uh, the criteria about human rights or sustainability or whatever is quite a right to to include those in the uh, award of award criteria for contracts as long as it is relevant to the subject matter of the contract. And many people kind of worry about this, and I think the answer is very straightforward and has worked for us on a couple of occasions. Um, if, you, if you were to say, instead of say uniforms, like in the last example, um, if you were to say ethically sourced or sustainably sourced uniforms, even just calling the contract that, that means that the criterion can be very sensibly applied um, because they are relevant to the subject matter of the contract. 
right, that's the first thing. The other thing I wanted to mention was statistically, what's the barrier? And I think that certainly in the United Kingdom here, there is still a lot of ignorance about this subject. And, there, and I just think that awareness, once people understand what the issues are and what we can do in public service to address these issues, then I think those barriers will fall away. We've made some recommendations here from universities to our government to say that we think that public procurers need to have that awareness and need to be upskilled to be able to conduct better due diligence in their supply chains. But we think that given time, it will come. Thank you very much, Andy, for this answer. Um, do other panelists want to react to this question? Okay. Yeah. No, Pauline here. I was I was just just to to say that the well, according to the Swedish procurement law in Sweden, there are no barriers, so that's why I don't have a comment. <laughs> Great. Well, then uh, we'll uh, move to the next okay. question. Okay, so um, this is a question from uh, Radu Kuko. Um, it was uh, directed to Claire, but I think other um, speakers can also uh, have an opinion on this. So, uh, why do you think some countries, such as uh, the US, went beyond general human rights approach in public procurement, uh, but also focused more narrowly on trafficking in human beings and public procurement? Yes, I can uh, take a crack at that. Um, I think the reasons differ across jurisdictions as to why specific issues have been pinpointed for focus within supply chains. Um, the UK and its example of modern slavery, for instance, um, and that's also, of course, been a specific focus in the United States which we don't see reflected across um, very many other countries at this point in time. Um, so I think that those are issues which are political, really. It, it depends which um, specific risks within supply chains get the attention of policymakers. And clearly, modern slavery and human trafficking are um, some of the, the gravest risks to human beings um, presented by globalized supply chains and lack of transparency and lack of controls. Um, so it makes a lot of sense um, in some ways to prioritize those. Those You asked also, Raju, whether this would be a more efficient approach. I think from the perspective of those single issues, yes, of course, it, it can be um, more effective because clearly you, you capture the attention um, of public buyers and those who supply to them in relation to that specific and you channel uh, their resources to trying to address that specific risk. On the other hand, um, of course, you may, by adopting a narrow focus, um, uh, divert uh, risks into other areas. You may also fail to address underlying um, uh, chronic and, and wider issues in the governance of the supply chain, which will lead to um, high risks uh, of broader labor abuses, for instance. So, you know, you may address one problem whilst uh, leaving others um, neglected. So, from a broader human rights perspective, I think we would say um, it's a, it can be fine to prioritize single issues, but unless you adopt a more inductive and broad spectrum approach, it's quite likely that you will, as a public buyer, still find yourself exposed to risks which may come back at you in the form of reputation or indeed legal risk um, as you know, as litigation around these sorts of issues um, does begin to, to show itself. And that could be child labor, um, for instance, or uh, long working hours, living wage issues, which are increasingly an issue in specifically in um, more advanced economies as well. All right, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, we now have a question from Paolo Faiola, who is asking what the best standard to, to use for uh, social responsibility is. Yeah. 
Panelit, do you want to um, react to this question? So uh, the question was, uh, what would be, in your opinion, the best standard to use uh, in social responsibility? Uh, for instance, SA8000. Um, All right, well, we will uh, then move to another question <laughs> from um, uh, Darmi Philo, um, who has a question about the new um, ISO that Claire was man uh, mentioning at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so how can the new ISO uh, 2400 contribute in sustainable procurement processes, especially in pro pro uh, public organizations, and can we expect innovations? Um, well, I can uh, try to answer that. Um, I have been able to provide some input to the development of the ISO standard on the human rights dimensions, and um, having seen the draft, although it's still a draft at this point, um, I think it will offer some very uh, useful um, guidance, in a, and, and of course it, it is systematic, it works from the top of the organization, um, through the policy uh, level and down to the implementation of sustainability at every point in the contracting process and, and of course afterwards in monitoring and evaluation. Um, and it does provide some uh, orientation on the human rights issues um, as well, although it does follow a more procedural approach. So it, it advises a, a, a root, sort of root and branch procedure to implement sustainable procurement within an organization, including human rights alongside other issues. So I think it will be a useful guidance. It, it is guidance, not a certifiable standard um, for organizations. Um, and uh, it, it should add value for both public and private sector buyers. And I think the ISO is considering in what ways it can best uh, promote um, the uptake and uh, the implementation of that guidance currently. Uh, once, once it's drafted. Thank you very much, Claire. We now have one last question from uh, Gilles Dana. Um, would it be authorized for a public buyer to launch a call for tender, including the request of a label like Blue, um, Blue Zine or Max Havler? Could you repeat the question, Elena? Um, I will read uh, Jill's question again. Is it authorized for a public buyer to launch a call for tender, um, including the request of label like Bluezine or Max Havler? Um, I, don't, I don't know if the, I've not heard of those particular labels, but I know that um, we get pressure in the United Kingdom, say, to purchase goods sustainably using a, a mark like um, Fair Trade or a Rainforest Alliance. And I, as I understand it, under the, uh, the directives, there are some very clear rules about um, setting labels, you know, a, a kind of um, a mark of, uh, of authority. To, uh, for, from a supplier that says that um, the goods and services have been ethically sourced in some way. Um, obviously, it needs to be done in a way not discriminate against suppliers in other member states, which uh, which might not be able to obtain the mark simply because the, they're located in another part of the continent. So, I would I would be careful about using la a label like that. Um, uh, careful of the discrimination angle on it. It might, it might be more sensible to set out more precisely the criteria, the, the characteristics of the goods, for example, that might be, uh, that might um, attract such a label, and, and then to say, for example, though this label or equivalent in, in another member state. Maybe I can just add that um, I think that also connects for the question that was asked about which is the best social standard, uh, SA 8000 or similar to attach to, to contracts. And as Andy has said, 
um, from the legal point of view, uh, it can be delicate to mention specific standards which may not themselves be defensible as, attack, as linked to the subject matter of the contract or may not be defensible to include as a technical um, requirement. Um, so uh, I know that some other public buyers have tried, well, have succeeded in getting around those sorts of issues. Um, for instance, by making references in uh, tenders to a specific standard, but at the same time providing that suppliers may equally uh, rely on a different standard uh, or no standard if they can provide evidence. Uh, that they are meeting in the, sub the substance of the standard. So they can rely on the given standard or a standard of, of equivalent um, criteria. So that is one um, way in which the buyer can uh, achieve flexibility that means that litigation risks that could attach with just focusing in on specific standards um, are avoided. Great. Thank you, Claire and Andy. Um, well, uh, Elena Mora uh, just asked one question for Katie, but I think other uh, speakers can also react. Uh, so the question is, did the procurement process uh, with human rights consideration increase prices products, the, the price of products, um, and if there are any studies linking prices and human rights considerations. Um, I can address what happened for us and the three vendors that we allowed to propose the one that we ultimately went with, the, they had the lowest price offering and they were a vendor that we were using, the police had been using before, and their pricing actually went down. Kathy, Kathy do you think that the, your price went down because of the, the volume uh, that you were purchasing, in, or uh, you know, between your different agencies, or uh, would it be to do with the uh, the way the products were sourced? I I think strictly to do with the um, volume, the purchasing power going up, that they saw that they'd have an increase in sales, and so they lowered the prices on things that they were offering us before. Um, maybe I could just come back to the former question um, on the social labels to mention that the German government is uh, currently developing a tool to support public authorities in um, their use of social labels in procurement contracts um, because social labels are mentioned and explicitly permitted, I believe, for the first time under the 2014 European Union procurement directives. Um, which does create an opportunity um, for public buyers to use and refer to those in the contracting process. But as you've, I think the, the questioner identified, um, and as our discussion has shown, it, it can be a, a risk issue if people are not able to use them in an informed and legally correct way. So the, the ambition of the, the German government's tool is to provide um, a very detailed comparison across the different social labels which exist, which will enable um, public buyers to integrate those into their contracts in a, a correct and neutral way. Um, whilst I wouldn't want anyone to undertake uh, un measured and uncalculated risks, I think it's just worth saying that as public purchasers we have a responsibility under the UNGPs to uh, to protect human rights uh, through public procurement and it's always it's always worth I think measure, measuring risk between risk of a legal challenge because you've mentioned a social aspect in your criteria that might be pushing the envelope of what's allowed under the regulations versus the very real risk that your public authority could be caught up in a scandal, you know, to do with uh, a human rights abuse within your supply chain. And our job in public procurement is going to be more and more how we 
measure and calculate those risks in, our, in developing our sourcing strategies. It's something we're going to have to become very skilled in, I believe. All right, thank you. Uh, we now have time for one last question. I see that we have one raised hand from... Um, um, okay, no, I mean, the, the, the person who wanted to ask uh, his question uh, apparently is now gone. So um, I think it's now time to uh, conclude. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so um, I would like to remind everybody that the webinar will be recorded and we will, ma will be made available soon. Uh, so we will receive uh, shortly a follow-up email with uh, all the presentation um, and uh, needed information, as well as the link to the recording. Uh, and yes, again, thank you to uh, panelists for sharing their experiences and to uh, the audience. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.